Hi guys, what's up? Brendan here. So a lot of people are under the impression that you need a lot of money before you begin investing. And this simply isn't true. You can begin investing with as little as $5 and you should. Now this didn't used to be the case because brokerages used to charge commissions and have minimums to invest with them. But new brokerages have started and a lot of them have zero fees. So today I'm going to get very basic and describe how to invest for a beginner. Now, many of you may already know a lot of the topics I'm about to cover, but it's a good review and good to go through to make sure you understand everything very clearly. So I'm going to review a lot of the top questions that a beginner investor would have. What is investing? Why should you invest? What are different types of investments? And how should you invest? These are all questions we're going to explore today because knowledge is power. And the more you know, the less scary investing becomes and the less likely you are to act emotionally. So let's get into it. So first off, what is investing? I have a sneaky suspicion that you already have an idea of what investing is, but let's define it anyway. Dictionary.com defines it as expending money with the expectation of achieving a profit or material result by putting it into financial schemes, shares, or property. Now this really isn't the clearest definition, but basically you're giving your money to a company, a government, or some other entity with the hopes that they'll give you more money back in return later. There are many different things you can invest in. Some of the most common are stocks and bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, real estate, REITs, commodities. There's a lot more, but I'll get into those later. So why invest? Should you be investing? And when should you start? Really the answer to that last one is as long as you have an emergency fund, you should start investing today, now, right away. So why invest? Well, let's think about the alternative. If everything you ever saved, you just stuck under your mattress and saved for retirement, then you'd never have any more money than what you put away yourself. If you invest your money, then at least you give it the potential of working and earning money for you. From 1928 to 2016, the U.S. stock market has averaged about a 9.8% return per year. Time is a huge advantage when it comes to investing. And the longer you can invest, the more you'll allow compound interest to go to work and grow your money. But what is compound interest? Simply put, it can be thought of as interest on interest. It's the interest calculated on the initial principal you invest plus the interest on all accumulated interest up until that point. Let's look at an example to show this a little bit more clearly. Let's say you have $100,000 to invest and you earn 7% per year annually. That means each year you'll earn $7,000. Let's say you take that $7,000 you earned each year and spend it. So at the end of each year, you're back to your $100,000 principal invested. By repeating this, you'll continue to earn $7,000 per year, but you'll never earn any more unless your returns increase. But let's say instead, rather than spending the $7,000 you earned each year, you left it invested. So in year two, rather than just investing $100,000, you had $107,000 invested. So 7% return on $107,000 invested is $7,490. So rather than just earning $7,000 in year two, you earned an additional $490. This is the idea of compound interest. The $7,000 you earned in year one, then earned you an additional $490 in year two because you left it invested. This grows exponentially over time and is like a giant snowball rolling down a steep hill. So let's expand on this example to a 30 year time period. So using the first scenario where you spent $7,000 per year, you would still have $100,000 of your initial principal invested and you would have spent $210,000 over that time period. $7,000 times 30 years is 210. So the total value is $310,000. But if you left your earnings invested and let compounding interest go to work, then at the end of 30 years, rather than having $310,000 worth of value, you'd have $761,225.50. You calculate this by doing $100,000 of your initial investment times 1 plus 7% to the 30th power. That's a difference of $451,222.50. That's the power of compound interest. And the longer you invest, the bigger difference compound interest makes. In the 31st year, for example, in the first scenario, if you invested your money again, you would have earned your $7,000 on $100,000 invested. But in the second scenario, where you have $761,225 invested, you would have earned $53,285. That's a 7% return on that amount. So earlier I mentioned an emergency fund, and I'm sure you've heard of it before. So what exactly is it? Basically, it's a financial safety net worth of cash that is meant to cover future unexpected expenses. You want cash of at least three to six months worth of expenses to cover you in most scenarios. So for example, if you and your spouse spend $2,000 per month, then you want at least six to $12,000 in this fund combined. In the beginning of this video, I talked about commission-free brokerage firms. So what exactly are they and how do you use them? Let's first start with just brokerage firms, brokerage companies, the basic. 
Their main job is to act as the middleman to connect buyers and sellers to facilitate transactions. When it comes to investing, for every transaction, there's a buyer and a seller. If you want to buy a stock for a specific price, then you can tell your brokerage company, they'll go out into the market and try and find a seller that's willing to sell that same security for that price. If they are able to find someone, then they'll broker their transaction. Discount brokerages often act as an online platform that allow you to hold your money and investments with them. With these brokerages, you manage your own investments, so you decide how you invest, when, and where. There's been a recent push for brokerage companies to move to zero fee. So there are no fees to hold your money there, and there's no commissions when you buy or sell securities. And there are a lot of good options out there. Depending on your personal goals and objectives, one brokerage may be a little better than another, but they're all very similar. Two that I recommend are Weevil and Robinhood if you're just starting out. If you use my links in the description below, then with Weevil, you can get up to two free stocks when you deposit $100, and they can be valued up to $1,400. With Robinhood, you can get additional free stock when using the link to open an account. Other brokerages are like are Fidelity and Charles Schwab. They're very big, very well-established firms. All of the brokerages I mentioned though, have zero fees, zero commissions, and don't have any minimums. These brokerages make it very easy to open accounts online, but there are different types of accounts you can open. So what should you open and when should you use each? Now there are a number of different accounts you can open, but I'm just gonna review a few of the most common ones. When thinking of these different accounts, you should think of them as different buckets or baskets. And each bucket or basket has its own specific goal in mind. So for example, you may have one basket that's meant for retirement, or you may have one that's uh, for down payment on a home. So each of these different goals or objectives may have a specific account that's best to help you accomplish that goal. And I know I'm only using dollar bills here, so please like and subscribe to this video so in the future I can be using $100 bills and make this a little bit more exciting. But you split your money up into these different accounts based on your objectives or goals, and then you invest the money. So the first account I'm going to review is an individual account, also known as a brokerage account. This is really your typical run-of-the-mill account. You can add or remove as much money as you want whenever you want. There's no tax advantage to investing in this account, but you are subject to capital gains tax in this account. Now more on that in a minute. This account is typically used to invest money that you'll need in mid to long term. So what I mean by that is not within five to 10 years. If you feel like you'll need your money within five years, then really you shouldn't be investing in the stock market. It's too risky and goes up and down and has the potential for you to lose money. One idea for how you might use this account is for a down payment on a home that you expect to buy in five or 10 years. You put money in here and help it grow so you can increase your down payment. You can also use this account to help add to your retirement savings, so way off into the future. But there are other accounts that are more advantageous to use first. So I'd only recommend using this account for retirement funding after you've maxed out the other retirement accounts available to you. So again, you shouldn't be using this account for any money that you need for day-to-day -day expenses or your emergency fund. The stock market is risky and it can go down. So any money you need for your essential spending shouldn't be put into this account. That money should be held in cash or very risk averse cash-like investments, something like short-term US Treasury bills. Another common account is a 401k account, and you've likely heard of it. This is an employer-sponsored plan, so hopefully you have access to one. This account is meant to help you save for retirement, and typically, contributions are deferred directly from your paycheck, so all the money contributed is pre-tax. There are limits to the amount that you're allowed to contribute to your 401k. For 2020, the maximum amount you're allowed to contribute as an employee is $19,500. Your employer can contribute additional amounts to your account. And a lot of times this is through a match program. So a typical amount that they'll match is about 3%. If your employer does match 3%, you should do everything you can to at least contribute 3% of your paycheck so that you get this match. It's just free money. Also, if you're over age 50, then you can contribute an additional $6,500 per year. So a total of $26,000 to your 401k. Now, although the money you put into a 401k is pre-tax, when you pull money out of a 401k, it is taxed as ordinary income. But having your pre-tax or tax deferred money grow and compound throughout your working years until retirement is usually an advantage. But be aware that once you contribute money to your 401k, you cannot remove it before age 59 and a half without having to pay a 10% penalty on top of the ordinary income tax. There are a few exceptions to this rule, but best practice is just to leave that money there for retirement. Another common type of account is an IRA. There are multiple types of different IRAs, but right now I'll touch on traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. A traditional IRA can be thought of very similarly to a 401k plan, but you don't need it to be employee sponsored. You contribute pre-tax money that grows tax deferred, and then when you pull the money out, you have to pay ordinary income tax on it. You also are not allowed to pull money out of a traditional IRA before age 59 and a half without a 10% penalty. In a Roth IRA account, you contribute after-tax money, so you've already paid tax on the money before you put it into the account. But it then grows tax-free, and when you pull it out, you don't need to pay any tax. 
In 2020, you're allowed to contribute up to $6,000 to Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs combined. And if you're over age 50, you can contribute an additional $1,000. But there are income limitations. If you make over a specific amount of money, then you're not allowed to contribute to these plans. In 2020, for a traditional IRA, if your modified adjusted gross income is greater than $65,000 for an individual tax filer or $104,000 for married filing jointly, then you're limited in the amount you're able to deduct on your contribution. If your income is over $75,000 for individual and $124,000 for married, then you can't deduct any of your contribution. For Roth IRAs, individual tax filers can contribute directly if their income is under $139,000 or married filing jointly under $206,000. If you make over $124,000 for an individual and $196,000 for married filing jointly, then the amount you're allowed to contribute directly begins to tear down. There are ways to get around these income limitations, specifically through a backdoor Roth IRA contribution, but I'm not going to get into that here. If you want to learn more about that, I've done a video previously where I go into more detail. You can find that here. Because of the penalties involved with removing money early from 401ks and traditional IRAs, you should only put money in there that you don't need until retirement. Roth IRA contributions, not the earnings, can be pulled out penalty free as long as the account has been open for at least five years. So when discussing the individual account, I mentioned capital gains. So what exactly are capital gains? A capital gain occurs when you sell an investment for more than you paid for it. So basically it's selling price minus purchase price. There's never a free lunch. The taxman always has his handout. Capital gains are either taxed as ordinary income if they're short term or some lower rate if they're long term. A capital gain becomes long-term when you've held the investment for at least one year. There are a few ways to minimize or avoid capital gains. One, you can just invest for the long-term and not sell your investments. You only realize capital gains when your investments are sold, and that's when you own the tax. You can also use tax-advantaged retirement accounts like the 401k, the traditional IRA, or the Roth IRA that I mentioned before. Those do not realize any capital gains. Another way to minimize it is by realizing capital losses. If you sell a stock for less than you paid for it, then you realize a capital loss, and this can be used to offset capital gains. As a quick example, say you bought five shares of Apple over a year ago for $200 per share, and then you sold it today for $240 per share. And let's say that within the last year, you bought 10 shares of Delta Airlines stock for $30, and you sold it today for $22. So that means with Apple, you realize a $200 long-term capital gain. So basically, you take your selling price of $240, minus your purchase price of $200, so you get 40, and you multiply that by your five shares to get $200. And for Delta Airlines, you realize a short-term capital loss of $80. So again, you take your purchase price of $22, subtract your selling price of $30, and multiply that by the number of shares, 10. So that's again how you get $80. And you can net your capital loss against your capital gain, so you are only taxed on $120 of long-term capital gains. In the beginning, I mentioned a few different things that you can invest in. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, real estate, REITs, commodities, there are many others, but let's define each one individually. So what exactly are stocks? Stocks are also known as shares or equity, and basically they're a security that represents ownership in a company. For example, when you own one share of Apple, you own about 0.0000002% of Apple. That's because Apple has about 4,443,000,000 outstanding shares of stock. So if you own one of them, then you own one divided by 4,443,000,000. But as a part owner of Apple, you share in both their profits and their losses. So if they were to make $100 million, for example, you would earn about two cents because of your share. Now I know, I know, that doesn't sound like a lot, two cents on 100 million, but Apple is actually worth about $1.1 trillion. So $100 million movements up or down happen all the time. So how did I determine exactly what Apple was worth? Well, with a publicly traded company like Apple, you basically just take the number of outstanding shares, which in this case was 4,443,000,000, and multiply that by the share price, which as of April 1st was $240. So when you look at a company's stock price alone, it really doesn't mean anything. Whether it's $240, $100, or $5, that means nothing on its own. But when you use that in conjunction with the number of outstanding shares, then you get the value of the company. So moving on, what are bonds? Bonds are a fixed income instrument that represent a loan made from an investor to a borrower. It's basically an IOU between a lender and a borrower. Now companies, municipalities, states, or sovereign governments will use bonds to raise money for specific projects or expenses. So basically you're giving a loan to these municipalities, these governments, or companies, or states, and they're promising to pay you back over a set period of time at a set interest rate. So all bonds have interest rates or coupon rates, really they're the same thing, and a set maturity date. The maturity date is just the date the bond comes to an end. 
Throughout the life of a bond, the company that issued it will give you coupon payments or interest payments, and then with the maturity date, they'll give you back your principal amount that you invested. Bonds are considered much less risky than stocks because unless you sell your bond or the company that issued it defaults or goes bankrupt, which is obviously terrible for that company, then you'll get your initial investment back plus interest. So what are mutual funds? Mutual funds pool money from different investors and use that money to buy different securities, usually stocks and bonds. Mutual funds basically give an investor the ability to purchase a basket of different investments through one investment vehicle. Mutual funds are operated by a manager or managers who determine how the fund will be invested based on the fund's investment objectives. Mutual funds are great at helping an investor diversify their holdings without having to buy a large number of securities. There are many different types of mutual funds representing different securities that they purchase, different investment objectives, and different return goals. Mutual funds can only be bought or sold once per day at the end of trading day. They also charge fees or expense ratios that are important to be aware of. Now, what are ETFs? ETF stands for Exchange Traded Funds. So basically it can be thought of as a mutual fund, but it's traded on an exchange, similar to a stock. Unlike a mutual fund, ETF prices are bought and sold throughout the day, so the price fluctuates all the time. Historically, ETFs have just tracked an underlying index, but this is beginning to change a little bit and they're becoming more like mutual funds where they can have different investment objectives. So real quick, an index is a hypothetical portfolio of investments which represents a specific segment of the financial markets. A common example of this is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 represents the 500 largest U.S. companies. Active investment managers often gauge their performance off of specific indexes. You can also choose to invest in vehicles that are designed to track specific indexes. So what is real estate? A lot of people are very familiar with real estate. Real estate is property made up of land and the buildings on it, as well as the natural resources on that land. Real estate is easier for a lot of people to understand because it's tangible. You can go out and see or hold exactly what you're buying. Stocks and bonds are less so. They're more on the computer or in paper. So what are REITs? REITs stand for Real Estate Investment Trusts. This is a company that owns and operates real estate to try and generate income. Holdings of these may include office buildings, apartment complexes, timberland, healthcare facilities, and many more. Their benefit is that they give an ordinary investor access to invest in these type of vehicles that generally will require a lot of upfront costs or a lot of knowledge that they may not have. And the final type of investment I'm gonna go over is what is a commodity? These are raw materials that can be bought or sold. Examples include things like precious metals, like gold and silver and copper, or maybe like coffee or oil. The basic idea is that there's little differentiation between a commodity coming from one producer or another producer. One bar of gold, the same purity and size, is worth the same no matter where it comes from. This is different than a TV or a stove, for example. The quality and craftsmanship that goes into producing this product can demand different prices. So we just talked about stocks and Apple and Delta, and we said Apple's share price is around $240 and Delta's is around $22. But how exactly is the stock price determined? Each stock has a bid and an ask price. The bid is what someone is willing to pay for one share of that stock. The ask is what someone is willing to sell one share of that stock price at. More popular stocks have higher volume, and often this bid and ask price will be very close to each other, sometimes within one cent. So basically, the bid and ask prices determine the stock's price. Stock prices, like basic economics, are determined by supply, or the ask, and demand, or the bid. As more investors demand to buy more shares, then the stock price goes up. And the opposite is also true. If many sellers are demanding to sell their shares, then that'll push the stock price down. So let's move on to some other common questions. What is a dividend? This is an amount that a company pays regularly to its shareholders through its cash reserves or profits. Cash dividends are most popular, but you can receive stock dividends as well. A dividend is value that a company is paying out to its shareholders. So typically when you see a dividend issued, the stock price will decrease by the same amount of that dividend. As an example, if a company's stock price is selling at $52 per share and they issue a $2 dividend, then typically after that dividend is issued, the share price will only be worth $50 per share. Now a company's value may continue to increase over time. So next time they issue a dividend, the stock price could be $53 per share. And if they issue that same $2 dividend, then it will only drop to $51 rather than 50. But it's important to realize there's really not much difference between receiving a dividend and just selling stock for that same amount. Dividends are taxable, and the amount of tax depends on whether they're a qualified or non-qualified dividend. Now, I'm not gonna get into all that here, so moving on. Now, what is volatility? Volatility is a measure of investment risk. And generally, the higher the volatility is, the riskier the investment is, and the higher expected return you should receive. Now, generally, volatility is measured using standard deviation, and standard deviation just indicates how tightly a stock price is to its moving average or mean. 
So a larger standard deviation points to higher dispersions of return, which increases investment risk. So we've talked a lot about investing so far, but once you've opened an account and decided what type of account is best for you, what exactly should you invest in? This really depends on your specific goals. If you need a certain amount of money within five years, then really you shouldn't be investing that money in stocks. The stock market is volatile and has the potential to lose money, as we've seen in our current crisis that we're experiencing. The best advice is to choose a specific investment allocation and stick to it over a long period of time. An investment allocation is just your specific mix of stocks and bonds. A common one is 60-40, 60% 60 in stocks, 40% in bonds. You should add money when you can and rebalance at least annually. Rebalancing is just the act of selling your positions that have become overvalued and buying your positions that become undervalued. This naturally causes you to sell high and buy low. Diversification or the mixing of a wide variety of investments in your portfolio is the single best way to reduce risk without giving up potential returns. You want to make sure you invest in U.S. and international companies, small cap and large cap companies, and get exposure to a lot of different sectors. Index funds are the easiest and least expensive ways to do this. Two of my favorite index funds are Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, ticker VTSAX, and Vanguard World Stock Index, VTWAX. The first one, VTSAX, invests in a diversified U.S. equity portfolio, whereas the second one, VTWAX, invests in a globally diversified portfolio. For bond investments, I recommend investing in high credit quality funds that invest in municipal bonds from your home state. This is the best way to get the highest after-tax returns. You can also invest in short-term bond funds, such as Vanguard's Short-Term Treasury Index, VSBSX, or something a little riskier is their Total Bond Market Index, VBTLX. Another investment option is a robo-advisor. You may have heard of it, but what exactly is a robo-advisor? These are automated investment advisory platforms and offer investment management services carried out by algorithms with minimal human intervention at a very low cost. Their services range from automatic rebalancing to tax optimization and require little to no human interaction. These can make a lot of sense for the right investor looking for a specific solution. Think of your money as a tool. It is a means to an end. Don't let emotions take over. If you invest for long enough, at some point you will lose money. I personally look at historical information and data to guide my investing. I don't use my intuition or feelings when I'm thinking about investments. If there is a market correction and you let your emotions take over, then often you aren't thinking rationally and you can make decisions that can impact you for a long period of time. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. I tried to stay very basic without really going crazy and defining everything. Is there any other areas that you wish I expanded on or would want to learn more? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. Stay healthy, stay safe, take care.